Welcome back to our Setting Up Shop uh, video series. Uh, today I want to talk about back saws. Uh, if you've seen the other videos that uh, Mike and I have done leading up to this, looking at the saws, looking at the rip saw and the crosscut saw, both hand saws they call them, uh, you will remember this, you'll recognize this. This is my big beefy rip saw. Um, and so what we're thinking about now is, okay, so we have big boards that we're trying to rip or crosscut, trying to get big stock into smaller parts to be able to bring to our bench. But if you're a cabinet maker, or you're gonna be working at other, some other small scale, you need to be able to cut mortise and tenons and to cut little dovetails, and you wanna cut small stuff. So something like this is just too big. So what you need to do then is get a, you know, another saw that's gonna be, take this exact thing and just downscale it, make everything smaller, shorter, uh, more teeth per inch, less set, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the real key here is that you also want the plate to be thinner. This is my rip saw. This thing is really beefy. It's really stout. Um, and all hand saws, hand saws are, are this. It's what you saw. These are hand saws, these big saws. Um, their, their saw plates are quite stiff, quite thick, because there's, it, they're, you're depending on the thickness of the plate to not crumple on itself or not kink. And so when you're sawing, you want that to be nice and stiff. Um, I do have a, a rip saw that's a little bit thinner than this one, and it, it is noticeably thinner, and it's a little nerve-wracking to use because it feels flimsy. It's an older one, but it's just there's something about it. I don't know why it's so thin, um, but typically they're, they're quite thick, something like 40 thousandths uh, for a rip saw. Um, a cross cut might be 30 thousandths or something like that. So when you're thinking about back saws, you want to be thinking about getting a saw that's 20 thousandths. That's half the thickness of this and, and shorter and smaller. So things like this. So this was my rip saw, my rip hand saw. And this is uh, what, what, we're call, what we call a tenon saw. It's a rip filed back saw. And so it's the same kind of thing. It's filed the same way. If you remember from Mike's video that uh, a rip saw is filed directly across as opposed to diagonal like the cross cuts. Um, but this saw is, the, the plate thickness is approximately half of this other one. So the question is then, if you're gonna use a, such a thin plate and doing your sawing at the bench, how is it not gonna just kink or crumple as you're pushing on it? Because this is a Western saw, remember. Japanese saws cut on the pull and Western saws cut on the push. So think about that. If you're pushing, you're putting all the pressure there, uh, it's gonna wanna crumple. And so you need some way to have a thin plate, but to have it stiff and rigid. And that's what back saws are all about. So these back saws um, have a, a folded back on the top. So it's a piece of steel, or sometimes it was brass, uh, folded over and squished together really tight, and then pounded on by friction to be able to stiffen that back. So now what's interesting about this is what I think a lot of people don't understand is um, that this folded back is, pin is pinching the saw plate nice and tight and it's not all the way seated, or it shouldn't be. Because saw makers, and I'm not a saw maker, saw makers can use this to adjust and retention the saw plate if it gets a little crooked, they can pull the thing in and out and do all their magic to adjust it. <clears throat> so this is designed to be adjusted. Now, uh, some modern saw makers, um, they, when they make their back saws, they'll, have a, they'll use solid stock and they'll just have a, a, a milling machine cut a slot and they'll epoxy the thing onto the saw plate. Now that works if there are no problems. <laughs> you know, you, if, if there are no problems ever, then you're all set. Problem is life, it doesn't work that way <laughs> and you're gonna have problems. And if you were to hand one of those saws to a, a saw maker or a saw restoration person, um, they're gonna look at it and say, I, I can't do anything for you, this thing is glued on. You know, you'd have to, I can make you a new saw, I can sell you a different saw, but I can't fix it. Um, so these folded saw plates are really um, valuable and important. Now there are some uh, modern saw makers who, who slot it on a milling machine, but I think they must pinch it or something so that it's real tight and they're, they're driving it on like that. So whether it's actually folded or slotted, the, the real important thing is that it's a friction fit so that it can be adjusted. You don't want a, an epoxied slot. So I think it's weird um, that these are called back saws and these are called hand saws. I don't know who came up with that, but I, I feel like uh, 
they should get more creative because of course they're both hand saws but that's what we call a hand saw and this is what we call a back saw to distinguish it's a type of hand saw maybe um, so <clears throat> the, there are three primary uh, back saws that a cabinet maker is going to have in the shop um, and this one already is uh, I talked about it's a tenon saw it's quite long oh no I'm not remembering it was a 16 inches or something like that um, but sometimes they're 17 inches or whatever too they can be a little longer um, you've seen maybe those big miter saws they're like you know massively long way longer than this that's kind of a different thing so we have these tenon saws that are filed for rip and therefore cutting uh, down the sides of tenons to cut the cheeks of the tenons so you're, it's an all a rip cut going with the grain and then you're going to have a cross cut saw <clears throat> which is commonly called a carcass saw uh, it's sort of a historic term um, so th the important thing is it's just a rip saw and a cross cut saw just like with the, the hand saws, you had a, a rip and a cross cut hand saw, you need a rip and a cross cut back saw as well. It just so happens that this is, um, that they just call this a carcass saw. Um, so this one's typically a little bit shorter um, and is filed like the little knife edge that Mike was talking about so that I can cut a cross grain. So this is for when you're, say, like you're cutting, um, cross cutting short stock to length or if you're sawing the shoulder of a tenon, you're going to be picking up this cross cut saw because you're sawing across the grain. Um, and th other than that, other than the way it's filed and the length, um, uh, typically this is a little bit finer in teeth uh, per inch. So this has, I think it's something like somewhere around 11 and this might have 14. So that uh, the tenon saw is a little bit coarser, more teeth per inch and the carcass saw is a little bit finer, um, but still nothing like my four TPI rip saw. Four teeth per inch is not, that's pretty beefy. Um, so you have these two saws, your tenon saw and your carcass saw, your rip and your cross cut, and there's a third one. Guess what it is, you know what it is? Uh, is it is a rip, is it cross cut, is it something, some hybrid? Uh, it's not a hybrid actually, it's actually another rip saw. Um, but it's a special rip saw. This is a dovetail saw for cutting dovetails. Um, it's filed rip because when you're cutting the dovetails down this way, it's actually mostly a rip cut. Although that at a slight angle, I don't lose sleep over it. You know, it's, it's still filed rip. Um, and this is um, maybe the coarsest. I think this one is 15 teeth per inch. And I think that's on the coarser end of what dovetail saws have been historically. If I'm not mistaken, I think the Domini um, uh, one of the Domini dovetail saws was like 19 teeth per inch, which to me is like way too, too, um, too fine. But, uh, what do I know, you know? Um, but a 15 TPI saw really works great for me. Um, and the, the other thing about this that's pretty, uh, distinct and different is you're thinking about this different operation. So this is for cutting fine little dovetails. And, you know, if you're cutting the, the, um, the cheeks off of tenons, to have a good amount of set on your teeth, remember down the saw plate, set is the way that the teeth cross each other, they cross other ways so they can cut a channel, it's called the kerf. So the teeth can cut the kerf uh, wider. And obviously if you have a saw plate and it's this thick, you need some teeth to make the kerf just slightly fatter so that the plate doesn't get stuck in the kerf, right? That's why you have set. And so, there's more or less set depending on the circumstances. Um, a saw that you're going to use in green wood or you know wet fresh wood, you're going to want more set because you need a wider kerf. Otherwise, that that wood's just going to close up on the saw plate. So, tenon saw could have a little bit more set. Carcass saw a little bit less. But the dovetail saw, you really don't want a ton of set on this. You're not trying to make a big kerf. In fact. Um, my kerf on my saw is even a little bit heavy. I've been contemplating backing off on the set and with that what I would do is I'd take a Swiss file and I would just very gently set on the edge of the teeth and run down the edge of the teeth ever so slightly, very gently, just to remove a little bit of that set. Um, because when I compare my, the, my saw kerfs from my, my dovetail saw to historic ones, even those often are, are narrower than mine. So um, it's important that a dovetail saw is quite thin um, with not a lot of set because it's really supposed to be doing very fine work. I do also use my dovetail saw for 
um, very small stuff. And even though it's rep, sometimes little crosscut things, um, you know, maybe cutting a, uh, a protruding pin, cutting that flush with this, that works actually quite well, just because it's so fine. Even though it's rip, if it's fine, uh, if, if they're fine teeth, then it works well. Uh, so the, the dovetail saw comes in handy for things other than just dovetails. So those are the three saws you need. But then once you start working, you realize, wait, well, I like this crosscut saw for certain kinds of stock, or this is really great for uh, moderately wet stock because the, the, um, the set's quite heavy, but I want something a little with a finer tooth and a little bit finer set. And then you go, oh yeah, so I just need a, a second carcass saw. So that way it's all set up for this kind of stock. And then you realize, oh, you know what? What I really should get is I should have one of those so that in this, <laughs> you can see where this goes, right? And then you got saws hanging all over the place and they all do something very specific. And I'm not gonna get on your case about that because that's a good habit. <laughs> that's a good habit to have. Uh, tools are, are endlessly fascinating. And what I find even with, with planes sometimes, my wooden planes, I have um, some planes that are set up quite aggressive and maybe it has a nick in the iron and it's kind of okay because that does some of the more aggressive work and then I'll jump to my, my usual four plane or something. So it's okay to have uh, redund redundancy built into your tool set. Um, as long as you know you can still pay your bills <laughs> um, but I guess the thing is that I wanted to, to emphasize is you, you, it's important to understand the difference between a back saw and a hand saw and the primary difference is scale it's it's for making small joinery for furniture scale work and so you want to be able to have a, a, a thinner plate but have it stiff and that's what the back is all about um, the only thing I'll add to this uh, in closing is just that um, obviously there's a limit to how deep you can saw right so as time goes on and you file your saw more and more and more these plates get narrower and narrower and you can't saw as deep anymore now for a crosscut saw you know this that's some pretty thick stock and that's probably not going to be an issue um, but for something like this for a tenon saw as this plate gets smaller and smaller and you're sawing down the, the height of the tenon as the tenon's coming up and you're sawing it you know that could ultimately be, become an issue this still has a lot of life left but it's one thing to consider that um, you'll see some old some old saws that they're just especially like dovetail saws they're just they start out small and they're just they get super narrow some of them are tapered uh, it seems like it's intentional uh, some of them were originally tapered so that there were um, there was more saw plate here than at the the toe up here um, and kind of like mine is here um, so that can be the case um, but sometimes I actually have a saw that's backwards that this one's heavier than this I think that's a problem I think that's an error that makes it awkward but the idea with the tapered saw plate is that as your hand is sitting there um, the tooth line is a little bit more it's easier to have it perpendicular to um, to the workbench surface. So I think that's a little bit um, a little bit picky because I've learned to get used to a lot of weird tool arrangements. Um, and I think if, if I didn't have this slight degree of taper, I would be just fine. I'd get used to it. Um, but uh, those are the things you want to be thinking about with back saws. Um, you want to get quality saws. Um, you want to be able to get saws that are straight. Uh, this isn't necessarily a video about how to choose a saw, but you want to find a straight saw um, that doesn't need to be sent to a saw maker to try to adjust the back and get it all fixed. Um, so that's it. If you have a, any other questions about back saws um, and you want to be able to you know, figure out what, how do I know what saw is a good saw or whatever, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments below. And also, um, if you like this content, if you want more of this kind of stuff, um, we have launched the M&T Daily Dispatch. So every weekday, we're just publishing videos and pictures and examining antique furniture and looking at antique tools. So if you want to sign up for that, you can click here uh, and sign up, and we will give you this daily deluge of information. And you can, as soon as you sign up, you get access to all the back, uh, all the back content. So sign up, join us, uh, and thanks for watching.